Uh, good morning and welcome. Uh, my name is David Watson. I'm with the McDonald Laurie Institute. Uh, I'm extremely pleased to be hosting such a prestigious group of uh, thinkers this morning about an issue that uh, I think Canadians really need to know more about. Um, first of all, just a little bit about the McDonald Laurie Institute. Uh, the risk of being a bit repetitive for those of you, and there are many of you, uh, who have been to these kinds of events in the past. Uh, but the McDonald Laurie Institute is the leading uh, independent, nonpartisan federal public policy think tank in the nation's capital. Uh, since its founding in 2010, we have grown each year in terms of public recognition and impact, and we've been attracting more and more of the top thinkers uh, and policy minds to our platform. Uh, we've also been increasingly recognized internationally. Uh, to name just two recent examples, in 2017, we're the finalists for the Templeton Freedom Award for the, world, the world's best think tank project. Uh, and in 2018, we're named the top social policy think tank uh, in North America by the pro uh, prestigious Prospect uh, Magazine Think Tank Awards. Uh, for today's proceedings, um, we'll begin with a keynote address by our guest, uh, Clive Hamilton. I'd like to give him a bit of time uh, since he came so far to be here, so he'll speak for about a half an hour. Uh, following his talk, we'll have a moderated discussion with uh, Professor Hamilton and our expert panel, uh, moder moderated by uh, Robert Fife of the Globe and Mail. Um, I have a request for all in attendance. Uh, one of our speakers, Duan Ji Chen, uh, would prefer not to be photographed uh, for security reasons for herself and her family. Uh, so I hope you'll all respect that. She's going to be seated at the end of the, of the uh, stage here, so it should be easier to keep her out of any shots. <clears throat> uh, however, I would invite you to join the discussion on Twitter using the hashtag uh, silentinvasion. Okay, let's delay no further. Uh, our keynote speaker this morning, Clive Hamilton, is an Australian author and a leading public intellectual in that country for 14 years. Until February 2008, he was the executive director of the... Um, Australia Institute, a pro progressive think tank that he founded. Since then, he has been a professor of public ethics at Charles Sturt University in Canberra. In 2018, his controversial book, uh, Silent Invasion, China's Influence in Australia, was published by Hardy Grant after three other publishers pulled out, citing fear of punishment from Beijing. It was an incident that made headlines as far as Canada and provided potent evidence supporting Professor Hamilton's thesis that a vast, deliberate campaign of influence operations aimed at undermining de uh, democratic institutions in Australia was being undertaken by the regime in Beijing. Uh, in an interview that, uh, last year, he told the Globe and Mail uh, that Canada is by no means immune to such a threat, so I think we'll all be listening very closely to what he has to say. Uh, so please welcome Clive Hamilton. Many thanks for that introduction, uh, David, and to the Macdonald Laurier Institute for inviting me to come to Cam uh, Canada to, uh, to talk about this, um, this issue that's only going to get bigger. I'm going to talk about uh, Chinese Communist Party influence in Australia, um, but it is, of course, highly germane uh, to uh, Canada. And I'll make a few comments along the way, and I'm sure in question uh, on the discussion, uh, segment and then Q&A, uh, we'll have an opportunity to explore that in more detail. Well, the um, Chinese Communist Party, the CCP, uh, its long-term objective is to absorb uh, Australia into its uh, sphere of influence and to shift Australia away from its alliance with the United States. And that objective was decided in 2004 when the Central Committee of the CCP resolved to include Australia in uh, what's known as China's, quote, overall periphery. That is to regard it like countries that have a land border with China and therefore needing to be controlled. The CCP views Australia as the weak link in the American alliance and as a European nation located in Asia, a major prize uh, in its push for strategic dominance in the Asia-Pacific region. And Australia has um, accordingly been the target of the full force of the CCP's sophisticated influence and interference operations. Canada's place in the CCP's strategic map of the world is as important as Australia's in its own way, uh, and it too has been subject to a full court press uh, of influence operations. As I show uh, in detail in Silent Invasion, uh, the CCP has been engaged in a thoroughgoing and systematic uh, campaign to shift elite opinion in Australia so that decision-makers act in ways 
conformable with Beijing's wishes. And uh, we can see, uh, so far with less clarity, a similar process happening in this country. I say with less clarity because um, people haven't been looking closely enough. Uh, once people start looking closely, uh, the structure of influence will become much clearer. I'm confident of that. Over decades, uh, the party has been building in Australia a complex network of agencies, sorry, the, the, the party has been building in China over the decades a complex network of agencies tasked with exerting influence abroad, and I'll show a, a chart of that network soon. The, and these agencies deploy uh, sophistic, uh, sophisticated techniques to influence, uh, persuade, and where necessary, coerce uh, others to act in ways approved by Beijing. And the techniques, these techniques have been refined um, over decades and are far more extensive, intrusive and secretive than those used by other nations. So in this lecture I want to focus uh, on the United Front Work Department, um, which is one of the main departments used of the party used for overseas influence operations. Uh, the others being uh, the International Department, the Propaganda Department, and the, the Liaison Department of the People's Liberation Army. Under President Xi Jinping, United Front work has assumed much greater importance uh, in the CCP's conduct of foreign relations. President Xi uh, echoed Mao Zedong's uh, description of United Front work as one of the party's three magic weapons. In the West, United Front work has traditionally been aimed at suppressing dissidents winning overseas Chinese to the CCP cause and then mobilising them to act uh, in support of Beijing's political and strategic interests. Um, this United Front work uh, aims to influence the choices, directions and loyalties of its targets by overcoming negative perceptions and promoting favourable perceptions of CCP rule in China. In Australia, over the last uh, 20 years, the party has succeeded in suppressing voices critical of the party, primarily those organisations campaigning for democracy in China, uh, for Tibetan autonomy, for Taiwanese independence and for the rights of Falun Gong practitioners. These voices are barely heard in the mainstream today. The effect has been that pro-Beijing elements are now seen as representing the Chinese community in Australia and are often reported that way uh, by the mainstream media. And politicians have been naively willing to associate with them. Now, two years ago, ignorance was a legitimate excuse for naivety. Uh, but after the extensive media coverage um, of Communist Party influence operations in Australia, beginning around September 2016, followed by a series of statements from uh, the government and from intelligence agencies, naivety is no longer an excuse uh, uh, for politicians uh, to um, associate in ways uh, without uh, much more vigilance. In more recent years, uh, United Front work, rather than targeting the overseas Chinese in Australia, although of course they continue to do that, uh, UF uh, work has increasingly been oriented towards promoting a more favourable view of the PRC, the People's Republic of China, in the Australian mainstream. And it's done so through co-opting and cultivating elites. And the strongly pro-Beijing views of sections of elite opinion today in business, politics, universities, testifies to the success of this campaign. The psychological techniques uh, applied in United Front work have been developed and refined uh, by the CCP over decades and are taught to cadres with the help of classified manuals. New Zealand uh, expert, uh, himself of uh, Chinese heritage, James To, observes, and he incidentally in his brilliant book arising out of his PhD thesis, he had access to classified documents in Beijing, somehow managed to get into the archives, uh, and wrote a brilliant thesis as a result, and he observes that the techniques applied to Chinese and non-Chinese alike are effective tools for intensive behavioural control and manipulation 
while appearing to be benign, benevolent and helpful. Now, this figure, a bit hard to read from the back, I'm sorry, uh, you don't really have to read uh, it in, uh, in all of its uh, details, uh, but, um, and it will at some point be available for your more detailed perusal uh, later on. So what this figure does, which I've developed incidentally, uh, based on a, a more complex chart in James Toe's uh, book. It, uh, it's an organisational organizational chart, an org chart, uh, of United Front influence activities in Australia. And a very a similar chart, I'm sure, could be constructed for Canada if someone took, uh, took the time uh, to do it. Um, United Front work uh, falls under the aegis of the Politburo of the CCP Central Committee. Uh, so it is a department of the Communist Party. Um, the third bureau of the United Front Work Department is tasked with carrying out influence operations among ethnic Chinese communities abroad and increasingly amongst mainstream communities abroad. And its four main agencies from uh, uh, left to right... Chinese Affairs Office, the China Overseas Friendship Association, the China Council for Promotion of Peaceful National Reunification, and the All China Federation of Returned Overseas Chinese. These are four agencies of the United Front uh, Work Department. Um, um, that have been active uh, in Australia and, and indeed in Canada. And the last one, the All China Federation of Returned Overseas Chinese, is formally um, connected to the Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference, the CPPCC, which is a large political advisory body uh, run by the United Front Work Department. And, and in fact, if there uh, one sure way of determining whether uh, someone, uh, an overseas Chinese person, is an agent of influence of Beijing is to see whether they are, in fact, a member of the CPPCC. Uh, it's a dead giveaway uh, because its membership includes uh, overseas Chinese who direct United Front uh, bodies abroad or who use their wealth to acquire political influence abroad on behalf of Beijing. There are a lot of, uh, there are a lot of billionaires uh, who are members of the CPPCC. Uh, it's a way of drawing them into the party network and, uh, and controlling them. Importantly, each of the four agencies I mentioned have provincial, city and county counterparts throughout China. And these have a direct role in maintaining and cultivating links with uh, provincial and hometown associations of overseas Chinese in Australia and elsewhere. Examples might include the Australian Guangdong Chamber of Commerce, uh, and the Australian Fujian Association. The CCPPNR, the uh, China Council for the Promotion of Peaceful National Reunification, the agency second from the left or third from the right, the agency of the United Front Work Department, is especially important for its work in Australia, where it's represented by its Australian organisation, which is known as the Australian Council for the Promotion of Peaceful Reunification of China the ACPPRC, which is shown down in the bottom row, uh, the uh, second from the left. And this is, uh, organisation, the ACPPRC, uh, has been described by United Front expert Jerry Groot uh, as the overarching organisational vehicle in Australia for helping coordinate smaller bodies. And there are branches of the um, uh, parent organisation uh, in Canada. Media attention on the activities and uh, Communist Party links of the ACPPRC and its controversial former president, a billionaire um, uh, Chinese person but Australian resident known as Huang Zhang Mo, uh, media, that media attention has been instrumental in raising public awareness of United Front activity in Australia. Um, and the central uh, organising and guiding role of the ACPPRC for many other Chinese Australian organisations is the reason why I give it its own box uh, in the bottom row of, uh, of this figure. 
The ACPPRC has uh, state-based uh, subsidiaries in each of the uh, Australian states, with Tasmania being the last state to acquire one in October of last year. In the uh, third box uh, from the left, we find, uh, which I've labelled other overseas Chinese uh, associations, I've lumped into there a range of um, United Front organisations, and they would include, uh, for instance, hometown associations like the one I mentioned, the Australian Fujian Association, business associations such as the Australia-China Economic, Trade and Cultural Association and the Australian-China Belt and Road Initiative. There are also ethnic Chinese professional and scientific associations such as the Federation of Chinese Scholars in Australia. And there are various cultural uh, and religious groups uh, such as writers' organisations. Uh, the Chinese Australian Writers Association, for example, has been infiltrated and, over and taken over by uh, pro-Beijing elements. Many uh, traditional Chinese um, community, uh, cultural, social and professional uh, organisations in Australia, which have been around for some decades, uh, have since the 1990s and particularly since uh, the 2000s been infiltrated and taken over by pro-Beijing elements. Much to the chagrin, of course, of uh, many uh, Chinese Australians. The, uh, also on the bottom row here, you see the Chinese uh, Students and Scholars Associations. Uh, let me see. What have I got here? Oh, sorry, there's that list of other overseas Chinese associations. Alumni associations as well. Uh, various friendship associations. Going back to the diagram, Chinese Students and Scholars Associations are a further category. They're an integral com component of United Front work uh, in Australia, helping to monitor the thoughts and behaviours of the some 180,000 Chinese students on campuses across uh, Australia. More recently, they've been uh, at the centre of brazen attempts to close down free speech on Australian campuses by organising online protests and calling in consular officials to pressure universities to discipline staff members who make statements in their lectures or tutorials contrary to Beijing's position, uh, such as uh, referring to Taiwan as a separate country. Confucius uh, Institutes uh, operate uh, more subtly. Um, the last uh, box on the right there, on the lower right. Uh, but leading CCP leaders have said that uh, Confucius Institutes are important for, quote, overseas propaganda and are part of a, quote, strategic plan for increasing China's soft power. Uh, there have been many in, uh, incidents. Um, Confucius Institutes, of course, have been highly controversial here in Canada with an excellent report from Canadian scholars on the risks of hosting Confucius Institutes, the same in the United States, and increasingly there are voices speaking out in Australia against them. Um, uh, and, of course, their presence has not been aided by incidents such as uh, this one, uh, where Victoria University in Melbourne, uh, which has a Confuci Confucius Institute, refused to host uh, the documentary, uh, which I think was made in Canada, in fact, uh, the uh, one about uh, the one critical of Confucius Institutes. And I think it illustrated how, in the words of um, leading uh, Sinologist Professor John Fitzgerald, uh, the presence of them signals to Beijing that the host university puts its relations with Beijing before academic freedom. All but a few Chinese language newspapers, so uh, going uh, back to the chart uh, on the left, uh, bottom left, uh, all but a few uh, Chinese language newspapers and radio stations in Australia. Uh, Chinese language media in Australia was once uh, very diverse and vibrant. Uh, now some 90% uh, or more of Chinese language newspapers and radio stations are controlled by pro-Beijing elements. They've been taken over. Either they were bought out or they were pressured uh, by uh, consular officials or others uh, to adopt a pro-Beijing line. Some of them had their advertisers withdrawn or threatened to withdraw unless they changed their political tune. 
Um, and as the figure illustrates, these media are integral to United Front activities in Australia because they communicate to the diaspora the CCP view of the world. They also have been known to foment uh, patriotic feelings and amplify of, uh, official messages. At times, these newspapers and radio stations um, uh, help uh, to promote uh, nationalistic gatherings of um, Chinese Australians and Chinese students in Australia, such as this uh, demonstration here uh, in Melbourne against the Hague Tribunal's ruling on the South China Sea in 2016. And these uh, pro-Beijing media outlets also um, uh, stir up Chinese students on Australian campuses to complain about any anti-China comments made by their lecturers. Well, elements of the diaspora have also been put to, uh, to good use, um, uh, targeting Australia's political leaders. Oh, look, I should stress, I hope this is apparent, that uh, the uh, Chinese community, Chinese heritage community in Australia is extremely diverse uh, in its origins um, uh, in its, uh, and in its uh, political orientation. Um, and those who... Uh, um, uh, are committed to uh, democratic values uh, and resent CCP intrusion into Australian politics are uh, numerous uh, but f mostly silent uh, because of the intimidation uh, that they uh, undergo as a result of the power of, uh, of Beijing uh, in Australia. Uh, and there have been some very uh, kind of uh, worrying incidents of... Um, pro-democracy Chinese Australians who are punished as a result of their political views. So, but uh, pro-Beijing elements of the diaspora have been put to good use targeting Australia's political leaders. One favoured avenue is to draw those leaders into engagements with uh, Chinese community organisations like the Australian Council for the Promotion of Peaceful Reunification with China and also festivals and cultural events like Chinese New Year celebrations, uh, where personal relationships, um, with Prime Minister Turnbull at the bottom there next to Huang Yang Mo at the Chinese New Year celebrations, uh, pro-Beijing elements persuaded the um, uh, state government to allow them to light up the Sydney Opera House uh, in those colours, which went, went down extremely well uh, in Beijing. Uh, not noticed very much in Australia, but quite a propaganda coup. And the point here is that uh, Chinese New Year celebrations, or more properly Lunar New Year celebrations, had for many years been an, a wonderful celebration of the contribution of uh, the Chinese community to the rich diversity of Australia's culture. Uh, but over the last uh, decade, um, uh, uh, Chinese New Year celebrations, the organising committees have been taken over by pro-Beijing uh, elements. Uh, we have discovered that the propaganda department of the party has been funnelling money uh, into certain Chinese companies in Sydney in order to fund Chinese New Year uh, celebrations and that's why you get someone like Huang Zhang Mo uh, who is at the very forefront rubbing shoulders with the Prime Minister. Um, the Prime Minister, Prime Minister Turnbull, uh, uh, our l lamented, uh, <laughs> newly departed Prime Minister, uh, would not do this anymore. This was a couple of years ago. He and most other political leaders, federally at least, are awake to what's going on here and would not, would be very reluctant to be photographed in what would now be seen to be a compromising position. In addition, uh, large donations to political parties have oiled the process of engagement. Uh, for example, uh, not sure what this picture, oh yes, this famous photograph, uh, uh, ACPPRC uh, President Huang Yang Mo, he resigned a few months ago, uh, uh, no, late uh, last year, um, reportedly demanded that the Labor Party uh, change its policy on the South China Sea, um, the Labor opposition, that is, if it wanted to receive a promised $400,000 donation. And this is, uh, picture is Huang Jung Mo standing in the Commonwealth offices in Sydney next to S uh, Labor Senator Sam Dastiari uh, uh, at a news conference for Chinese media 
uh, where Senator Sam Dastyari um, uh, mouthed uh, Beijing's position on the South China Sea contrary to his own party's position. He said Australia has nothing to do with the South China Sea, it's a matter for China and uh, Southeast Asian nations, and uh, we should uh, butt out and take no role and have nothing to say. Um, he, not long after, uh, was forced, after further scandals uh, connected with Huang Jiangmo, he was forced out of parliament. He did us a great service, actually. Um, so, um, another example is election meddling of political interference, is election meddling. Uh, the Sydney uh, Chinese consulate is believed to have link, been linked to uh, uh, a social media campaign in a by-election in December last year in the electorate of Benelong uh, in Sydney. Uh, uh, the electorate in Australia, which is believed to have or does have the largest proportion of Chinese Australian voters. The um, Chinese consulate is believed to have been behind a social media campaign uh, aimed at unseating the uh, sitting Conservative member. The, the, the Conservative member had to resign because of a, a problem with uh, dual citizenship, Section 44 of our Constitution. He recontested the election. Um, uh, the government had a one-seat majority, and so it was crucial that the government should win this by-election. It was a safe Conservative seat. Nevertheless, there was a, uh, a very strong social, in, in fact, uh, uh, virulent social media campaign against the government aimed at sending a powerful message about Beijing's capacity to mobilise Chinese Australian voters um, to vote this way or that, and about the political risks of pursuing the proposed counter-subversion laws that were then before the Australian Parliament. United Front organisations also encouraged their members to enter politics uh, by joining mainstream parties, and they're eclectic in their political orientation, um, and running for election to federal or state parliaments, and indeed uh, local councils, which can provide experience and contacts. Uh, Canada, of course, has uh, noticing some experience uh, with uh, precisely this. Um, uh, members of these organisations are also encouraged to seek positions in politicians' offices. Um, ASIO, uh, Australia's equivalent of CSIS, uh, was uh, reported last year to have identified around 10 political candidates at state and, count and local government elections, whom it, ASIO, believes have close ties with Chinese intelligence services. Finally, after they have left politics, influential and well-connected figures uh, from uh, Australian politics are recruited to the PRC cause uh, through inducements such as positions on prestigious boards uh, in China um, or lucrative positions with Chinese companies um, or through uh, the funding of think tanks, uh, in the case of Bob Carr, uh, former foreign minister. Um, others like Paul Keating uh, put on the... Uh, China Development Bank, um, and uh, Andrew Robb, the former Liberal uh, Trade Minister who negotiated and pushed through, some say with indecent haste, the uh, China-Australia Free Trade Agreement. In fact, it's a, a China-Australia um, Free Investment Agreement. Um, uh, even former military people, uh, a former Admiral, was recruited to be the Chair of Huawei's uh, Australian Subsidiary Board, and became a very uh, uh, firm advocate of the independence and uh, interests of Huawei in Australia. Um, now, it's well known, I think, uh, also, uh, once uh, Canadians start to look closely at what's uh, going on, the same will be discovered here. It's well known that Beijing's influence activities often target countries, provinces and regions that are relatively poor and feel hard done by. Um, I've been looking recently at Tasmania um, because people in Tasmania, after my book came out, started to email me and phone me and said, you should see what's happening down here. Uh, so I started to have a look. And it's pretty apparent after I started looking, uh, with some very good help from certain people, uh, that for some time a concerted campaign has been underway to extend the CCP's political influence in Tasmania. And the structure of influence organisations uh, on the mainland... Um, uh, some of the kinds of organisations that I've mentioned 
uh, have been in recent times set up in, uh, in Tasmania. Here's the uh, uh, Tasmanian branch of the ACPPRC, um, had its grand launch at, uh, uh, in the Tasmanian Parliament House at the invitation of the Speaker. Uh, there's still a great deal of naivety down there in Tasmania, although that's starting to change in recent weeks. Um, surprisingly, perhaps one of the central figures to emerge in Tasmania um, is uh, a man named, uh, uh, known as uh, Wong Jin De, or Master Wang, uh, who's the leader of a large and uh, wealthy esoteric Buddhist sect, uh, said to have three to five million uh, members, including many in Canada. Uh, quite a few of these Canadian followers or devotees have arrived in Hobart to uh, study uh, with him. Um, here he is. Uh, Wang Jinder's uh, website is quite unabashed about his desire to promote President Xi Jinping's China dream and to tell a good China story, to propagate China's voice. He has said that we will hold the latest policies enacted by the motherland as guidance for everything we do. This is a Buddhist sect operating in Tasmania. And um, he's managed to uh, uh, acquire many friends at, uh, in politics. There, here he's shown with the uh, Premier of Tasmania, the former Premier of Tasmania, the current opposition leader, leader of uh, Tasmania. And he's been very effective at, um, uh, at uh, ingratiating himself into uh, the community and among leaders by the use of his lion dancing troupe. Uh, everyone in the interests of good multicultural practice is very happy to have a lion dancing troupe come along and add colour and movement to any event. Um, so let me finish by making just a few comments, and I'm sure there'll be more questions uh, on this, about Australia's pushback strategy. Uh, there's been a, gr a substantial shift in public awareness over the last two years in Australia, a shift which is yet to happen in Canada, uh, and there's been a substantial uh, pushback strategy against CCP influence. Um, and uh, the building blocks put in place by the Tur Turnbull government have been to protect Australia from uh, this systematic campaign of influence and interference. And the centrepiece has been the new foreign interference uh, law, which was passed by Parliament in June of this year. And the foreign interference law is extremely interesting because it defines... Um, in law, uh, the notion of foreign interference, which is new, a very kind of new thing, uh, phenomenon to be uh, defined in law and criminalised. And, and the new legislation proscribes conduct is directed, funded or supervised by a foreign principal um, or someone acting on its behalf. So not just a foreign power, but also a state-owned enterprise or a private company that can be shown to have close links to a foreign government. So activities that's uh, essentially on behalf of a foreign government and is intended to influence a political or government process or the exercise of a democratic right and is covert or involves deception, threats or menaces. In short, engaging in covert activity on behalf of a foreign power and aimed at influencing government process or the exercise of a democratic right in Australia is now a criminal offence, punishable by long jail sentences, 10 to 15 years. Let me give a couple of examples, and then I'll finish off, of the kinds of activities uh, that um, uh, uh, are expected to be criminal offences. The law is yet to be tested in the courts, and we're all looking forward to that. Um, or most of us are looking forward to that, I should say. Um, for example, and these are just stylized examples based on real cases, a wealthy donor with demonstrable links to the CCP um, privately threatens to withdraw a promised large donation to a political party unless it changes its policy on the South China Sea. Or an organisation acting at the behest of the PRC consulate mobilises its members to disrupt a legitimate demonstration by Tibet autonomy supporters and to intimidate those taking part, in other words, exercising their democratic right to protest. Or, in the midst of an election campaign, a person aligned uh, to a United Front group and in consultation with the PRC consulate circulates within the ethnic Chinese community a letter denouncing one candidate or party as anti-China 
and urging them to vote for the other candidate. There are a bunch of influence uh, activities um, that won't be captured by the new legislation, um, although the, the government has put in place a range of other measures, legislative and administrative, that are aimed at uh, uh, suppressing uh, influence activities operating in Australia, including the establishment of a critical infrastructure centre to assess foreign investment in uh, critical infrastructure, uh, beefing up the operations of the Foreign Investment Review Board so that um, to put greater emphasis on national security considerations, uh, uh, strengthening the Defence Trade Controls Act on the export of technology, and this follows revelations that s scientists linked to the People's Liberation Army, in fact, people, scientists who actually hold rank in the PLA, have actually been working uh, at Australian universities um, on military-related research, sometimes with funding from the Australian government. This was actually revealed by me and my researcher, Alex Josky, in some newspaper stories last year, and it's, and it's re reproduced in the book. And it came as a shock to everyone involved. And incidentally, um, there will be a major report coming out at the end of uh, this month from Australia uh, detailing much more extensive uh, links between PLA scientists and Western universities. They don't declare that they're PLA scientists, so those who bring them into the labs are innocent of this. Um, uh, that, so this major report coming out at the end of this month will detail this um, around the Western world, including in Canada. So keep an eye out uh, for that. There are PLA scientists working in Canadian universities. So um, I've used up my time, uh, but I'll just finish on this very last point, that I think in Australia we're still a long way from institutionalising the uh, new China vigilance uh, to the point where we can be confident of rebuffing the CCP's sustained attempts to influence, interfere and subdue. For example, while progress has been made at the federal level, the new national stance seems to have passed over the heads of some state governments uh, who are still keen to pursue deeper economic links at whatever cost. Uh, well, uh, yes, um, <laughs> without any uh, consideration of the national security consideration. So there's a great deal of work for Australia still to do before we can be confident uh, that our sovereignty and democratic processes are no long longer subject to unwelcome influence. And I want to stress that uh, I and I, s I guess most Australians want to have a strong, harmonious, sustainable relationship with the People's Republic of China. But we don't want to do it at the cost of an erosion of our sovereignty in the exercise of our democratic rights. And although we are uh, in Australia putting up barriers to Beijing's influence operations, uh, in the end uh, it's going to be down to Beijing to stop attempting to interfere in our politics and erode the exercise of democratic rights in Australia. Uh, that will be the basis for an enduring, harmonious and healthier relationship between the two countries. Thanks very much.